Turn to the book of Philippians, please, tonight. Amen. The book of Philippians, chapter 1. And we will begin reading in verse 27, 27 through 30 tonight in the book of Philippians. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good to be in the house of God tonight. Hallelujah. Okay. If you have Philippians 1, 27, say praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. The Apostle Paul says here, verse 27, only let your conduct, really that should be citizenship. So only let your citizenship be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and in nothing terrified by your adversaries which is to them an evident token of perdition but to you of salvation and that of God for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Amen. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Amen. Amen. Verse 29 again. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. The title of the message tonight is The Gift of Suffering. The Gift of Suffering. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise and the worship. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word of God. Amen. Uh, the Apostle Paul has been talking to the church of Philippi. He is imprisoned in Rome, in a Roman jail, a house arrest. But he has a hope and believes that he will be released. And at some point that he would be reunited with the church of Philippi so that he can be a blessing to them. But he does not know the future. He does not know if that's going to happen or not. He's waiting for the verdict to come down from Nero as to whether or not he will live or he will die. Amen. So he does not know. But yet he's encouraged and he's believing, he's rejoicing that God will make a way for him to again see them. But if not, he's willing to die for Christ and either way he's rejoicing. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so just to read a few verses leading into this, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Amen. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by the coming to you again. So you see he's uh, anticipating the possibility that he will once again be reunited with them. Be set free from prison but he does not know for sure. Okay. Now he is an apostle of God. It seemed like he would know everything right. He would know the future right. Wouldn't you think that? If you're that close to God like Paul. Wouldn't you think that you would know everything that's coming? Well, you might think so, but he didn't. He didn't know if he's going to live or die. The verdict hasn't come yet. But he's trusting in the Lord. Whether he dies or he lives, he's rejoicing in God. Amen. He knows that if he continues to live, it'll be a blessing to the church. If not, he gets to go to be with the Lord. So he's anticipating the possibility of dying uh, for Christ at this point. And... So he begins to change his focus somewhat uh, upon the Philippian problems 
that they are having. They are being persecuted. They are suffering at this time uh, for the gospel's sake. He begins to focus on them. He begins to teach them, number one, who they are. And then number two, how to handle these problems in life. And I think you're going to be shocked tonight by what God says to us through his word. Amen. So first of all, he says this in verse 27. He encourages the church of Philippi. Please look at it. Verse 27, he says, Only let your citizenship be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. He said, that is the most important thing. When you're going through opposition, you're going through suffering, you're going through times of trial in your life for the gospel's sake. He said, the most important thing, he said it this way, the only thing is let your citizen be, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, they would totally understand what he was saying because, remember, I told you that Philippi was a little Rome. It's a little Italy. Okay? And so, the language of Rome was spoke there. The dress of Rome was there. The law of Rome was in, in Philippi. You could go into the shops there and basically everything there was Roman. Okay? And uh, the people in Philippi, even though it was in Macedonia, they would pride themselves uh, of being a citizen of Rome. Most of them were. Not all of them were. But even though they were in Macedonia, they would still pride themselves as being a Roman citizen. So they're in Macedonia. It's a Greek uh, culture, Greek city. But there's a Roman setup there. Does everybody understand that? Okay. So they'd be really excited about the citizenship of being a Roman over there, call themselves Roman citizens, dress like Romans, speak like Romans, etc. Uh, really proud of that. Amen. So Paul uses that. He says, you understand as a foreigner that you are representing the, the fatherland of Rome. Correct? Even though you're in Macedonia, you are a reflection of another country. You are a reflection of Rome in the way that you talk, the way that you dress. Amen. The laws that you have. You are a Rome. You're reflecting the fatherland of Rome. Even though you're in a different culture. In a different place. Amen. Does that make sense to you? So Paul is pointing out to them. That they are a citizen. Of another land. Of another country. And even though we're on this planet. In this earth. Our citizenship. Is in another land. And we are to reflect. That fatherland, if you will, which is called heaven. So go to Philippians 3.20, please. Amen. Paul makes a reference to this there. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, so we, you know, we're, our citizenship is in heaven and we're looking for the King of kings and Lord of lords to come and get us and take us to that uh, heavenly place where we're a citizen. But right now, we are citizens of that heavenly place, but we're on the earth. And we are to manifest heaven here. So that when people look at my life and they look at your life, they are to come in contact with God. They're going to see, how are they going to know God? How is anybody in the world going to know God? Yes, brother, that's right. You are, the Christians are a reflection of God, and they are a reflection of heaven. That's what we are. So when we are in the earth, we dress a heavenly dress. We talk a heavenly talk. We live by heavenly laws. And the people of the world look at us, and when they see us, they go away with questions. What is that person about? And it's simply that we, we have a citizenship that is not here. It's in another place. And we're reflecting that heavenly city that we're a part of, amen, while we're here on this earth. And so the church of Philippi would completely understand what Paul was talking about being in Macedonia, but yet reflecting the Roman Empire with their dress, their language, their laws, etc. that governed them. And so when you would come in contact with them, you would come in contact with little Rome or little Italy. So a Christian, you and I as Christians, are a reflection of heaven. 
And we're a reflection of God. We should be. And when people come in contact with us, they're coming in contact with the body of Christ. And so Paul is encouraging the church here in Philippi in this very difficult culture that they're in. He says, only let your citizenship be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, he says, I'm not sure if I'm going to come to you or if I die. This is basically paraphrased. But he said, either way. He said, if you see me again, I come to you. Or if I don't come to you, he said, you just keep rejoicing. If I die, rejoice. If I get to come and be with you again, rejoice in that. But the main thing is this, Church of Philippi, in the midst of all of your problems, in the midst of all the opposition that's coming against you, the most important thing is this, is that you and I continue to be a reflection of the heavenly citizenship which we are a part of. God put us here so we could reflect God to this world. Amen? Now, so verse 27, only let your citizenship be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast. Okay, here's what he said. This is what I'm looking forward to. He said, number one, you're citizens of heaven. You're citizens of God. And you're on the earth. And he says, I'm telling you and he's asking you to be uh, continue to be faithful to the gospel of Christ. But he says, here's what I'm believing I'm going to hear. That you stand fast in one spirit. With one mind. One spirit. One mind. So number one. He said I'm going to believe to hear. There's going to be unity among the church in Philippi. There's a reason why he's saying that. Okay. His focus is going to be on two things. Unity. Say unity. And what else? Perseverance. Those are the two things. That he's focusing on to this little church that he wants to hear about. And that is there's unity in the body and there's perseverance in the body. So here's how he words it. He said that uh, we would stand fast in one spirit and one mind. That's unity. So he says what I want to hear about you is this. He says when I hear about you I want to, to hear that you are one. That you are like one person. Okay, one soul, one mind. And and as I said in the course on dynamic soul win in part two, the book of Philippians talks about the mind, a lot about the mind. Okay, so in your mind and in your spirit, we are to be one. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, "I, I need to get closer to the body of Christ. Okay, no division. But let there be a oneness. That the church would be like one person seeking to spread the gospel. Okay, amen? Secondarily, he said, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, he recognizes that the situation that they're in is difficult, persecution, opposition. But he said, unity, number one. Number two, that you struggle There's going to be a struggle. And what's the struggle about? What is the striving about? For the faith of the gospel. What he means by that, don't quit. In the midst of opposition, in the midst of the difficulties that are coming against the church. He said, what you're going to do is you're going to be one mind. Amen. Like one person, unity. And you're going to strive. That means you're going to struggle. You're going to keep on going. You're not going to quit in the midst of the opposition that's coming against you. Amen. Now what is interesting here is the word striving sounds like an athletic term. Okay. The Greek word sunath, uh, sunath luntes. Uh, let me put it this way. Sunathalentes. Othalentis, hard word to say, soon Othalentis, you can hear the term athletic, can't you? Can you? Okay, maybe not the way I pronounced it, but it's there. Okay, so the point that Paul is saying is that there's going to be unity in the church, number one, and you're going to strive, struggle like athletes struggle. 
Okay? So how, how can he do this? How can you talk about oneness and then talk about athletes, plural? Because he's, what he's emphasizing is that you are struggling, you are striving, striving, but you're on the same team. He said you should be one team and you're striving, amen, as a team. Sort of like this, okay? How many of y'all ever run a relay before in track? Okay? Yeah, I, I, praise the Lord. Amen. I figured Sister Jasmine had run track before. You ever seen her stand up here and jump? Man, she gets off the ground. She's like, boing. Sunday, I was thinking, man, she must have been a track person because she's bing, bing, just right off the ground, you know. Uh, but anyway, so when you're in track, there's a relay team, right? Okay. So that's the picture here, a striving and a struggling as a team. And so you're struggling and you're passing the baton to each other. Now, if you win the race in a, that kind of a race, a relay race, who wins? The team wins, right? So what Paul is saying here with this Greek word, he says you're on the same team. And you need to understand as a church that we, you need to be one as one person, but come together, draw close together, and struggle and strive, amen, for the spreading of the gospel as one team, even though you're individuals in that church. Praise God. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? So we, the gospel will win ultimately. The gospel will win when the church stays in unity and the church perseveres. No matter what comes against it, it's like a team. We're going to stay together. We're going to run together. We're going to win together. And ultimately the gospel wins in the midst of the opposition. Correct? Okay. Now verse 28, he goes on and he says... In nothing terrified by your opposition. All right. So you have this opposition that's coming against you. And he, stay, he said, stay in unity. The point is that when the church begins to go through adversity, the church begins to face opposition like the church of Philippi was. What happens in a church when opposition comes? What can happen in your family when opposition comes? Division. So that's why Paul is focusing on to be in one mind and one spirit. The unity of the church because when opposition comes, the, the opposite of that is to have division. Now, what would create the division? Because everybody in that assembly may have a different mind or a different thought as to how to handle the problems, how to handle the opposition. You with me? Everybody going to have a different opinion about how to handle it. But Paul says when the opposition comes, he says you are to stay in unity, number one. And number two, you are to strive together as an athletic team. Get closer together. Are you all with me? So the opposite effect most of the time of opposition is division and scattering. So Paul says don't let when the opposition comes to the church. He says don't let that cause you to have division in your midst. Number one. And he says don't allow it to cause you to run. You stand fast. You persevere. You struggle. In the midst of that opposition, like one team with one goal, and that is that the gospel would be spread. Because the word he uses here, and then nothing terrified. The word terrified means, he says, don't panic. Don't panic. Amen. Amen. The Greek word means this. Don't be like wild horses that are spooked. That's what the Greek word means. Okay. So when the opposition comes... If we're not careful, what do we want to do? We want to run. Now, don't lift your hand. The Apostle Paul is not saying that, that it's a, you know, he's not teaching against the psychological thoughts of, of a person that's going through emotion of thinking that, man, I got to get out of here. I got to run, you know. 
That's not what he's saying. He's not saying don't have those feelings. They had feelings about running. Like a spooked horse. At times you may have those feelings. Well, I'm going to quit. I'm done. I'm getting out of town. You may have those feelings. Paul's not correcting that. But what he's saying is when you start going through those feelings, he said don't yield to them. Don't run. Don't panic like a bunch of wild horses that have been spooked. Amen. Stay together. Stay one. Continue to struggle or strive to spread the gospel in the midst of that. Amen. Don't be divided in adversity. Don't run in adversity, but stay together, amen, and keep striving and struggling so that the gospel can go forward. Isn't that amazing?